Hola, buena tarde. Good afternoon. Uh, we're going to start with this afternoon session. Let me introduce you to Fernando Muñoz Gomez, who is the CEO of Smart and Green Design and who has uh, specialized training in the field of sustainability. So I encourage you to uh, check his bio in the program that the organizers have um, given you. And he is going to share uh, with us a, a presentation that is called uh, message versus date, dealing with the calculations necessary to make the decisions that we know we need to make. So I hand over the floor to him, and I thank him for being here with us. Okay, so first of all, uh, let me say that it's a pleasure for me to be here today. I came to Pontevedra 10 years ago to talk about uh, museum related topics and conservation related topics and it's a great pleasure for me to be here today to come back to Santa uh, Pontevedra. Our study has a horrible name. It was about some intuition that we had at some point whereby we wanted to try and convey what the day what we did through the change of the initiative uh, words sounded a bit pretentious to us so we decided in spanish so we decided to choose the english words uh, especially based on the word green which we wanted to identify with in a time when uh, sustainability was not that relevant in the field of temporary exhibitions our ambition at our company uh, at this company that we founded 10 years ago was to understand what was happening to us in our professional field, a temporary exhibition that was sort of discouraging us to some uh, to some extent. We didn't really understand what we were seeing every day that was uh, demotivating us. We thought that it was related to the essence of uh, temporary exhibition, which is that it, when it's born, it's also doomed to die. Uh, so uh, it's like a perishable product. Uh, if we wanted to do things better, we needed to understand how the figures behind the financial and material and human effort in that uh, is involved in the assembly of one of these expositions, an exhibition that's going to last for two, three or four months. So we asked ourselves, uh, and at the moment when the Arts and uh, Arts uh, Council Museum of uh, England uh, was trying to raise awareness among all the culturally relate, culture related institutions that they needed to control the energy consumption of their buildings through uh, lighting, etc. They were doing this, but they didn't pay attention to what's go no, what was going on in the buildings uh, in temporary exhibitions. So we wanted to understand what was the CO2 um, emission impact of a tempor temporary uh, exhibition and whether it was uh, worth to uh, devote uh, resources to try and reduce this. If we compared what was happening in this type of uh, exhibitions with other parameters we wanted to try and uh, draw a conclusion so we started to uh, understand that we as designers had a very limited control of the um, environmental impact of a temporary exhibition so we wanted to work in a coordinated way with other factors because at the end of the day an exhibition has sort of four main blocks of uh, actors who make decisions and who are uh, these uh, decisions are counterproductive either they all go in the same direction or uh, it's not going to be uh, of any use to try and be very uh, friendly when respectful with uh, a number of issues if uh, the, uh, the curators of the uh, of the exhibition does not take these issues into consideration so uh, with a view to Understanding this, we started to dissect this and to analyze it uh, according to the four uh, groups of uh, people responsible at 
a temporary exhibition and the stages that they uh, take part in. So there are a number of moments when uh, a number of people are making decisions that have an influence on the final results. So we have four main decision maker groups, the museum or the organization, and then the uh, curator, the, people who, the person who is in charge of the contents of the exhibition, and then us designers from those who are occupying a space in that field, and then also uh, lighting and so forth, and then the companies who are in charge of implementing this. So in the four uh, cases, uh, we find shared decisions or individual decisions. So it was about trying to understand these uh, decisions or to make these uh, decisions understood. So at a specific moment in time, we try to understand how we were perceived. We exhibition designers who wanted to sell a product that was that involved a greater level of responsibility in comparison to others. So we did this in uh, an academic uh, context. So we had the support of some professionals who are specialized in the issue of uh, service and statistics. So we did this in England at the University of Oxford. So we had a, a, a very big uh, response from the cultural uh, fabric in Britain, which responds very well with to this type of uh, academic uh, uh, projects. We tried to replicate this in Spain, but we basically didn't get any reaction. So this dealt with three different uh, topics uh, from different perspectives. And the goal was to know what museums think about uh, architects, if they trust us, and if they do, why or if they don't why the conclusion was very simple actually i mean museums and i was interested in museums because i wanted to understand who is hiring you how uh, the institution that is hiring you is and what do they expect from you so we started to understand that creativity in an, a non-delivered way is normally associated with a process that can actually generate problems in the face of uh, more consolidated protocols or the or better known protocols that generate a uh, security in terms of result as certainty and it is uh, logical for this to happen this happens to anybody in any professional field but if we break down all of the uh, technical profiles that, uh, that participate in the design of uh, an exhibition, we realized that there was one profile only that was respected and that was perceived as uh, fundamental, and that was lighting, the lighting technician. Why? Because these people can actually uh, bring uh, evidences. Uh, they can just say, I reduce consumption in this, and this is going to have a reflection on your final costs or invoice. So once I understood that, I decided that I wanted to do the same kind of thing. I wanted to try and explain why this uh, financial investment is uh, reduced and is translated into an improvement. But in my case, not an improvement in terms of invoicing, because in the case of a temporary exhibition, the most important thing is not to get to know what the consumption is, but uh, uh, there was a this was a matter of identity and a matter of creating uh, good practices. How do you measure that? Well, that's the problem. We weren't very sure about how uh, you can do this and what you can actually explain. So back then, uh, we uh, started uh, contacting or we started uh, dealing with uh, um, carbon footprint calculations existing in the field of museums uh, with protocols that have been uh, enforced for many years now. So we replicated the uh, calculation analysis processes and we applied this to a, a small temporary uh, product uh, that is taking place within a, a building and we took into consideration all of the peculiarities of this phenomenon so the goal was to understand and the extent to which we could actually use data to justify our work so this are uh, uh, the results of the uh, answers to the survey. When we talk about sustainability, we could see that if you compare a uh, creator to a, a technician, 
a creative professional and a technical professional. Um, normally, you uh, will feel that managers do not know how to assess a, a project uh, uh, to determine whether it is um, uh, uh, profitable or not. But it's harder to actually analyze the impact of CO2 with a view to investing in something that reduces CO2 emissions. So uh, the survey, uh, in the survey, any issue that is related to sustainability involves more work for all uh, participants. And last but not least, there is a certain degree of association with the fact that uh, ecological products, uh, environmentally friendly exhibitions generate a certain uh, uh, shared aesthetics that uh, does not correspond to the uh, realm of uh, a good quality exhibition from the visual point of view. So these are uh, issues that uh, well mean that um, we tend to associate uh, these kinds of things with, I don't know, uh, materials such as cardboard. So once we started to understand these uh, responses, we uh, set up this uh, table with uh, make decision-making process, a number of stages. And once we understood all of this, we translated this into a specific situations that happen in a temporary exhibition that uh, happen all over again questions that are asked all the time and answers that are answered all the time. So this uh, table uh, shows the whole decision-making chain. We identify the key uh, question and we try to identify the wrong answer. And based on that, we try to suggest the right uh, answer. So what happens here is that uh, in these six tables, as soon as you in make some improvements in terms of responses. When you put them all together, you can achieve great results. So the preconceived idea that you're generating more work, it's a lie, actually. It's not true. You don't need more work. What you need is a little bit more attention when you formulate the, uh, uh, the, the, the question and the answer. So this uh, table intended to be a tool to be shared with people who work on management uh, to um, determine whether they felt identified. So in our professional uh, field that we share with people who uh, work with this type of specific actions in specific museums, we had a quality check just to make sure that we had identified the proper uh, hot spots and it, uh, the result was that it did make sense. So we added this to the research process. The hardest part of the project was to uh, conduct an analysis of the uh, an exhibition life cycle. And again, uh, this uh, sounds easy. We have uh, all talked about this already. Uh, a product, uh, whether it is an exhibition or a shoe, has four moments of intervention uh, or an interaction with the environment. Firstly, the extraction of the raw material that's going to uh, give you the opportunity to generate that product, then transporting that raw material or the final product from the consumer, from the producer, sorry, to the consumer. The third um, element is the energy consumption that this operation requires. In the case of a building, this is easier to understand because this is about the energy that the building needs to be comfortable. The uh, l electricity bill, the gas bill, the fuel that the uh, vehicles need, and last but not least, uh, waste. Uh, what do you do with uh, waste? So once you've understood all this, and how uh, in an exhibition there is an impact on the six uh, different moments, the inception, the conception of the project, the design of the project, the assembly, the use uh, of the mm, exhibition and the mm, disassembly. So you can make another uh, table and identify the uh, steps of this block. So if I want to calculate the environmental impact of the manufacturing of a showcase, I need to know what are the materials, uh, what is the 
transport means they're going to bring the museum to my uh, company and the amount of hours that I need and the amount of flights that I need to manufacture this um, showcase is quite easy and quite mm, general. Uh, uh, showcase that have a two three four square meter visual impact uh, let you know what is the co2 that you need to produce these showcases uh, panels uh, graphics uh, um, walls so with this data that we identified uh, uh, that we were the first to identify uh, this is a carbon calculator. It's four uh, Excel documents inter that are interconnected. So you enter the data and then you get a final result on the carbon footprint generated by an exhibition. So you take into consideration all of the different uh, actors that take part in the process. So this calculator was presented in, tw in 2015 to uh, an, a, a competition for innovative uh, projects in uh, England, organized by the um, uh, British Architects Association. And nobody had conducted a, a case study like the one we conducted with all the different uh, uh, components so that you can have that um, carbon footprint result in one figure only. This is something that we did also for all the particularities of um, consumption in an exhibition uh, room and all the uh, management uh, steps that are associated with this assembly. This is a table that puts us in front of something that we had not noticed and that is that when you talk about carbon budget people uh, understand this better than when you talk about uh, carbon footprint and this is because um, an exhibition it has a financial budget in passive house in the world of architecture there is a budget of uh, for the construction of a house so you realize that if you spend a lot in the facade you're going to have less money for the inside of the house if you uh, uh, set up a lot of um, uh, uh, solar energy devices, well, you're going to have less uh, money for the rest of the house. So if you have two uh, males coming from New York, well, this means that you're going to uh, have to use or build a shorter wall. So this is related to the physical project with uh, transport management for works and people with the electricity use or the energy use, not only in the room, but also around the room. Uh, the teams and the companies who are producing outside that uh, space. And so you have intermediate data and total data, so you can have uh, a, a result and then you decide on how to uh, invest in this regard. So if we look at uh, a final amount, uh, well, we need to know what this amount is. What is the appropriate uh, amount to say that an exhibition is um, sustainable? So we need data to do this. However, in architecture, we already have this table. So a house that can be called passive house needs to consume less than X tons of uh, CO2 per year. And that is the piece of data that uh, uh, gives you the opportunity to obtain artificial certification. So how do we collect this data? How do we gather this data? What is the uh, protocol that we need to use for people to understand that they have to get a number of uh, data during the process, throughout the process, to calculate the footprint of this exhibition and to accumulate these figures throughout the years and to try and understand good practices. To this end, we try and design some action models that we would be given away to the uh, various uh, agents that take part in an exhibition. And we have realized that against all odds, at the end of the day, what we have is that we as designers are the ones who have the, have the uh, smallest ability to transform or, or, or uh, the smallest influence on transformation. So the real impact uh, lies with 
uh, management uh, by the organization promoting the uh, exhibition. It was quite frustrating in the sense that we thought that we were going to fix a lot of things, but we uh, realized that we uh, were actually uh, not that relevant in this uh, uh, circuit. So once that we tested this, after testing this calculator, we started uh, using it with the La Casa Encendida. Uh, cultural center. This was a place in Madrid that had an internal audit already had been conducted deliberately and also the calculation of its footprint with yearly goals to reduce the impact by uh, 10%. So they already had a policy. So when we got there and we uh, proposed to them, we suggested to them the project to analyze some of the exhibitions, we realized that, uh, well, uh, this was a quite quite a complex uh, process and like I said, that was a fantastic place and they were only uh, pioneering place in, 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 in Spain, but they were also taking into consideration uh, heating, electricity and fuel. But I didn't mention anything connected to the activities that are carried out inside the building. So we suggested that we could study three different types of uh, these events. That, uh, they're very different. The first of this is uh, uh, a, a, an exhibition that happens within the star system with uh, art, famous artists that come from all parts of the world. This was an exhibition on Louis Fuller. Then we identified another typology, which is an emerging uh, art event at the national level where you control the uh, geographical range to a greater extent and artists do not uh, belong to a system that requires a number of uh, males, uh, insurance, uh, etc. But it's more uh, flexible. And lastly, a small, a short uh, uh, traveling exhibition that is of informative nature. And it was uh, about uh, policy, about politics. So the three exhibitions had uh, different surfaces. They had very similar lengths, and they allowed us to they allowed us to establish a certain degree of comparison. So this is the information that we started with. This is what we got from the La Casa Encendida space. So they gave us the their. CO2 use per year, we identified the gaps existing depending on the uh, group and the data that are associated with the exhibition. So the main points in terms of a uh, temporary exhibition were connected to um, other issues outside the building and then expenses and the impact of transport and everything else that is not even included in the original table that is related to production, assembly, etc. I'm not going to go through the whole analysis process, but I'm going to tell you that we realized that there was a uh, behavior uh, pattern depending on the type of exhibition that changed the use of CO2 to a great extent. This is obvious, this is very intuitive, and we've talked about this this morning. So the foot, CO2 footprint is related to transport. The rest, the design of the exhibition, energy consumption are uh, not that important at all. So, But this changes when we move on to the national uh, level we have a bigger impact. And when you go to an informative uh, exhibition of a small size, well, you can see that the basic impact of this kind of exhibition is designed because an informative exhibition has to be uh, traveling in spirit. Uh, and all that is uh, done there is supposed to be zero waste. However, Transport is relatively small. It is just the transportation from a building to another, but there is nothing that needs to reach the exhibition to be exposed or to be exhibited. Uh, this gave us some uh, clues that helped us be strategic when it comes to designing. So the next step was to redesign the whole process of the three exhibitions, not just the architectural part, but the whole uh, decision-making process from 
the curators to the managers and the assembly company. So we reached uh, an extreme of good practices, what could have been done back then, but we respected the final uh, result of the project, not just the materials at some uh, point. So we realized that uh, a good practice for these three exhibitions could lead to a reduction in the emissions of La Casa Encedida by 18.6%. And, and we realized that this had started to make sense. Nearly 20% emitted by the Casa Encendida if you distribute it to the activities and to the temporary exhibitions and you can control it. It does have an impact and especially the uh, La Casa Encendida had um, yearly 10% reduction goals. So if you pay attention to the temporary exhibitions, well, I'm not saying that you need to isolate yourselves more or change in um, consumption. So if you change the design, you uh, exceed the yearly goal by two. So what you do basically is to analyze data. Here you can see the breakdown of the um, impact and we can see that the main impact is related to transport, the issue of manufacturing and then uh, energy and finally waste. That doesn't mean that waste does not have um, waste does not have an impact, uh, but it means that uh, things are not improved when you get to that point. So a more specific analysis in the case of exhibitions, uh, such as the ones that we have already mentioned, the goal of 10% could be met by means of these papers and out of this 10%, only 6.3 was uh, connected with a good uh, transport management. So up to here, everything's fine. Um, data gave us the opportunity to understand how to improve our uh, strategic, uh, I mean, design strategies and how to create uh, an interaction with managers to help them in the decision making process. What is the problem in all cases when we suggested to do this, the response that people give you is, how am I going to be able to brag about this? How do you convince me that this is going to be worth it? So we started realizing that everything that we had analyzed didn't make any sense. The creation of the narrative was very important, how you tell things and how you make people understand things. At the end of the day, we all want to see uh, a powerful exhibition, we want a um, um, word of mouth uh, phenomenon to occur. And when you have a product that has a picture, this is much uh, easier to sell to other institutions. So unfortunately, we realized that this was about a matter that is much more related to marketing communication than uh, the CO2 footprint calculation. So for the last 10 years, we have tried to uh, implement this. It's been quite difficult. At some point, we haven't been able to do it. But here is an example that has given us the opportunity to create that uh, perfect context where we can actually uh, send a message, not just to the institution, but also at the uh, international level and within the field that we are more interested in, the field of design. The um, exhibition design uh, sector is a, uh, a sector that is not that common. So we need to find the means or the channel necessary to tell our story. This is an exhibition that we set up a couple of years ago, and in terms of uh, content, it gave us the opportunity to uh, touch on very interesting uh, things. It was about the future uh, and about uh, four pillars, a uh, growth-based um, 
future, collapse, discipline, transformation, the four pillars of the uh, future. So there are a number of researchers and experts that give some pros and cons for the four different situations. None of them is going to be real, probably fully, but uh, this is a mixture and this uh, changes from country to country. So in the face of this scenario that was basically curatorial, we thought that, or we felt that, uh, we were uh, identified with one of the four future situations. It was discipline. It is not about, uh, um, well, uh, punishing ourselves, not that much. It is about uh, finding order and fighting chaos, therefore. So we were going to implement this in the design of our project. So we're going to try and build with less as much as possible, as often as possible. We were going to try and make this a very accessible design. And the word sustainability is some sort of an umbrella for all of this. So we have recently realized something that we're not aware of. It's a very specific moment in time when the world goes mad in terms of consumption on consumerism, and this is the 50s, the 60s, especially in the US, going from uh, scientific positivism and its implications. And it means that basically back then all of this uh, machinery uh, uh, has the has the telecommunications to thank when it comes uh, to its popularization. So we thought that it was very interesting to look at these um, storytellers uh, because they are to a certain extent the uh, ones to blame for the uh, current situation, the hyperconsumption uh, uh, that is so uh, common today. So in the 60s, the social movements uh, connected to the planet uh, started to uh, gain uh, strength. And considering that this was an icon for us in terms of the contents of the presentation or the, the, the exhibition too, and that the exhibition was being housed by uh, Fundación Telefónica, we suggested an experiment to uh, Fundación Telefónica for them to tell us about what was happening in the uh, central buildings, the hubs, at that specific moment when uh, the digital society is turning analogical cables into nothing. They are actually disappearing. There is a, uh, a certain degree of um, uh, problem in terms of um, management, and that is that these companies have many more uh, physical spots for the distribution of cables, but cables are not used like that anymore in terms of uh, storing uh, systems uh, uh, in a lot of uh, other um, uh, areas or spaces that are around Spain and that are empty. So the game is, uh, I'm not going to design an exhibition for you. I want to visit your spaces. I want to identify everything and then see what I can do with that. The goal is to have uh, zero um, emissions for this. Uh, so our game was sort of uh, accepted and for a couple of months we were uh, organizing uh, traveling exhibitions and we discovered some places that we didn't think uh, existed, which is uh, technological cemeteries. Uh, telecommunication companies cannot uh, throw away any uh, technological device immediately. They need five years uh, in a place that somebody is managing. So. After five years, they are going to be implemented again. There are a number of associated policies. So these places, which are huge premises, have all type of things, as you can see in the image. 
So we get to these places and we realize that the real wealth of the project, the richness of the project was there, not in smaller spaces, more controlled spaces that maybe a Telefonica had. So we conducted a selection process for the materials and we thought that it was general enough and versatile enough to be able to assume the contents of the exhibition, whether it was spaces with or objects with day prevention uh, needs. Uh, among other elements. So we design these uh, devices by uh, bringing together different uh, uh, um, equipment, uh, old equipment that we would re reuse, antennas, and other devices and tools, and a lot of cable too that was not being used. So we created these devices and we designed the exhibition based on that. There was a, a, a deliberately communicating process uh, that was based on the basic material and the results. So what we would find, this showcase, for example, has uh, books from the National Library that have uh, uh, very strict uh, conservation uh, standards and a number of elements that created an antenna landscape in the room, which was the message behind the project for us. We did understand here that we could communicate that uh, uh, the, these elements have not been manipulated, they still have scratches. Uh, uh, everything was printed on paper and not on vinyl, so we tried to turn uh, antennas into uh, more or less sophisticated uh, systems with uh, lighting, um, uh, rig I mean, depending on the topic. So the goal of all of this was to uh, participate in a contest that we are very interested in. It's a design contest organized by the uh, magazine Frame the Frame magazine, which is uh, uh, a contest where, well, they tell you how uh, selecting criteria are distributed. So this means that this is a very democratic process because it is not about having a better or worse uh, uh, design or a higher or lower budget. It's about uh, for us and we took part in this contest in July and we were competing with Foster and great projects. So what happens here is, and this is the good thing about this uh, and about Dutch people, is that you get uh, four scores, uh, two, four twenty-five percent. Uh, all the final scores divided into four. So you have 25% uh, for each score. The second criteria is functionality. The third criterion is uh, innovation. The first one is creativity. So they force you to include reflections, some food for thought regarding technology. At the end of the day, we live in a technological society, whether we like it or not. And the fourth score, the fourth 20%, the fourth quarter was sustainability, your sustainability strategy. And all of a sudden, this is the mm, score that changes uh, the whole score because our project that was, uh, uh, I mean, got very good scores, got the best uh, mark in sustainability out of the more than 1,000 projects that, uh, from all over the world that were presented. Uh, so uh, we won the uh, award. Uh, very uh, modest uh, exhibition in Madrid. We uh, competed with um, uh, Shanghai hotels, Shanghai hotels, and this kind of thing. So the conclusion is that what won the contest was the message and the narrative of our idea. Unfortunately, data are not that important in this story. The important thing is the picture and a 100 word uh, text that explains the goal of the project. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Now we will move on to the uh, talk given by Miguel Angel Lorite. 
it is impossible to summarize his uh, CV, his experience in just one introduction. So I would invite you to read the, the program. He has wide expertise in lighting uh, on behalf of the public and the private initiative. We have actually studied with his textbooks. So I'll just give the floor to uh, the next speaker who's going to talk about sustainable lighting in museums. Thank you. First of all, uh, Fernando and I have already been here before in different times. That's a critical uh, point in time going through the economic erosion. And back then, I thought, well, I'm going to talk about lighting, but I'm also interested in different things. So, well, I, I think that back then I decided to criticize the whole cultural bubble that we have all experienced, also in Galicia. So that bubble had actually stopped libraries to receive newspapers, to receive journals. So I thought, this is all I want to talk about, the crisis. Years have gone by, and I, I'm still in love with lighting, but um, right now we are going through complex times, threatened by an eco-social crisis, and I'm not just talking about the climate change, I'm going to speak about something that goes beyond climate change, and possibly the climate change is the core element, but there are other things. So I'm going to talk about lighting, but just uh, succinctly. But in order to compensate for that, given that uh, the communications uh, responsible person has asked me to talk about lighting, I have sent them uh, my latest book, Lighting in Museums, and you will be getting a copy. So each of the attendees will receive a copy about my book, my latest book. So the thing is that today uh, we have to talk about narratives. We have a very big problem with narratives. So first of all, we've got the scientific narrative. People talk about a greenhouse effect, for instance, and everybody says that a Swedish man um, discovered the uh, greenhouse gases and uh, he was a great chemist, Arrhenius, and he was given the Nobel Prize. But then uh, Ada Lovelace, as we all know, was the mother of computing, apart from being the daughter of Lord Byron. So uh, for centuries, 50% of human talent has been hidden. So um, first of all, I need to advocate for Eunice Newton Food, who was the first person who discovered or made a first experiment showing that the greenhouse effect was real. And then a bit later, John Tyndall, working in a proper lab, made a machinery which uh, drew the same conclusion about greenhouse effects. And then Zwante Arrhenius received the Nobel Prize. So the greenhouse effect was discovered in the 19th century, as you can see, and it is undeniable. This is about maths and physics. We are talking about pure science. Well, in the same picture, you can also discover something else. Have you noticed what I'm talking about? What stands out from this slide? Well, anyway, the uh, greenhouse effect. Succinct, indeed, this is what it is all about. It is a scientific measure which says it's 0.9 
watts per square meters that will not dissipate from the Earth's surface. Sometimes it's even more than one watt per square meter. So it is an, an actual scientific measurement and it cannot be denied. But some people still deny it, like this guy, Kilin in Hawaii uh, a few years ago. Actually, he made a measurement of CO2 emissions in ppm. So he drew this uh, stairway, which is going upwards and reaching that figure. And this is not an invention. This is science, once again. Uh, actually, last week, last weekend, rather, the average global temperature increased 2.6 on Saturday and 2.7 on Friday, both here and in China, everywhere. Obviously, you can deny that, but it is undeniable because there are like thousands of millions of interconnected sites where you can survey the average temperature week after week. And this is a graph, the real graph of temperatures, temperature change from 1850 to 1900 and then up to 2020. So these are actual measurements of temperature. So we will probably increase more than 1.5 degrees. The Resilience Institute of Estocolm made an assessment last year and by evaluating some thresholds, they uh, they would classify the world into safety zones. So green is safe zone, uh, orange is increasing risk, and red is uh, actual high risk. So you have some stats that you can actually find on that website, stockholmresilience.org. And uh, the what we call the overshoot days, Currently, uh, the overshoot day was May the 27th for Spain. Uh, May the 27th was the, Sp the Spanish overshoot day, where demand exceeded resources. And this is not an invention, this is an actual measurement. However, there are still people, like this guy, um, who is a bit cheesy, this, this professor, Mm, uh, from Clinton, uh, he believes that CO2 is good, great, and he actually made a statement signed by a thousand people, some of them scientists, and unfortunately four of them were actually uh, Nobel Prize awardees, Nobel Prizes of Physics, so they are basically deniers and they are financed by the Forum for Democracy from the Netherlands, which actually won last Sunday. And then they are, uh, they are uh, xenophobes, almost Nazis, uh, fascist people of the far right who have unfortunately won the elections in the Netherlands. So if you add all those parties in a place like the Netherlands, which used to be so civilized, there is at least 35, 40 percent of the people of the population that will deny climate change. In the case of Spain now, this graph corresponds to Spain. So El Cano, uh, an institute from Spain, carried out a survey a couple of years ago asking people, uh, most scientists do not agree about the existence of climate change. They, they pose this statement to people and stratify them uh, depending on age and academic level. So it seems that if you have a degree, you would be uh, better at, uh, you know, ascertaining reality. And the fact is that actually most graduates deny climate change in Spain. So actually, mm, 
people some people go to college and other people just you know just go through it or survive through it and that's it and this is also in in line with the age groups the income Status also has an impact and also ideology, what we call ideology. And I'm saying this because I think that the narratives are important. Right now, you need to understand what the narratives are in the media. In parallel, a researcher from Pompeo Fabra decided to uh, analyze the different frames of climate change deniers and analyze how they have evolved. So it seems that there are uh, different graphs. Some people saying that they do not believe in it. Others believe that they have doubts. So there seems to be a crescendo of scientific or pseudo scientific reports, um, according to which people um, don't actually um, believe in the certainty of climate change. And then the, these are the the biggest countries responsible for CO2 emissions in the world. That is well known. USA, Russia, etc. And you can see where they are located, where the real problem comes from. The the problem is focused on just one quarter of the world, such as USA, Russia, China, India. They are the biggest spenders of energy. So um, we also need to understand that, I mean, what, what has been going on to the UN. I mean, nobody's listening to the United Nations anymore, as we have seen in recent weeks. But actually, we continue to increase energy consumption. And there is only a very small, which small percentage which co corresponds to electricity, and that could be replaced with renewable energy sources. However, it is still a very small percentage uh, the rest comes from fossil fuels, gas, coal, oil. However, there is a very uh, important part of the discourse that says that all of that could be replaced with renewable energy sources. Let's see if that could be. Actually not. In this country, in Spain, uh, there was a law which was called the National Plan of Energy and Climate, uh, passed by some smart people. But actually, the evolution in Spain follows more or less the same trend. Actually, in most uh, developed countries, the energy consumption continues to increase and the CO2 emissions continue to increase too. Obviously, there is a difference uh, between developed countries such as Nigeria in Africa with 223 million people compared to the US with 340 million people. Uh, actually, although Nigeria is a well-developed country in Africa, the per capita per capita consumption is nine times bigger than the consumption. I mean, the EU, the US consu consumption is much bigger than that from Nigeria. And well, there are some very uh, worrying stories. You can see this man, Hoover Hubbard, actually, um, a chemist who came to the conclusion that every fossil fuel would reach a peak this has been argued with, but well, generally speaking, it is true that the peak of oil was reached in 2000, 2005. So uh, regardless of the trend of oil consumption, there will come a point when there, there will be a decline in, in oil production. So 
according to the International Society of Energy, they say that the peak was reached in 2010, 2015. So the picture on the left, which comes from the 19th century, the oil drill in Texas. It is well known that if you, you, you dug up in Texas, you would immediately get a squirt of oil. Now you, you need to dig deeper, around 10 kilometers, and what you get is no longer a jet. You just get like a sponge of bituminous material. So the energy return rate, which was 100 in the beginning, the energy return rate is at most around 30%. So actually, uh, the party is about to be over. Fernando showed us a beautiful picture of his exhibition, and he talks about a great acceleration. This is a very important concept. I'm going to give you a very simple example. Uh, people said, oh my god, oil is so expensive. So people told you, if I take a liter of oil, and I, I try to climb a slope with my car, and I spend the whole liter of oil, and then I go downhill, and I get uh, people to push my car up the slope again, and you pay those people for pushing your car up the slope. Even if you paid 500 times for the price of oil, I mean, Basically, the great acceleration uh, meant that the states were selling out oil too cheap so that uh, basically the West could enjoy that party. So this is a reality which is undeniable. Anybody can, can make sure that this is true, but as I said, the party is almost over. So. When do people think uh, about it for the first time? Well, it began in the 1970s. The Rome Club, which was financed by several uh, oil corporations and energy corporations, decided to actually measure the limits, the threshold of growth. So they, uh, they commissioned the MIT with a, with a report, which was made by Jay Forrester and Donella Meadows, based on a new science, as if to say. So they, they had to base their study on computational science. And that guy down there, Jay Forrester, is the person who actually made the computers figure out this dynamic of systems and limits of growth. So they began to, to, to deal with uh, plenty of data and to make crossover of data so that they came up with the so-called systems and limits of growth. So in the 1970s, they have warned exactly about what we are facing today. This was reviewed in the year 2000. Uh, Donella died later on, but the research group came to the same conclusion. This book was obviously ignored by the oil corps, and there was a huge advertising campaign against this uh, scientific book. And many scientists were actually bought in order to counter argue the findings of the paper. Uh, simultaneously, there was another mathematician, Georgescu, who had been working in the US, Georgescu Rowegan. And uh, he thought about something which is called the function of production. This is uh, one of the pillars of the economy, the function of production in capitalist theory, well, they use formulae, of course, and so uh, the function would be capital times work, F equals C times W. So uh, the guy said, 
you cannot put a price on nature. If you have one liter of petroleum, which can uh, be equal to the work carried out by 500 people, that is uh, a gift by nature. So you cannot make that comparison because it's, a, it's something that nature gives away. And which has happened uh, because of a natural chemical process. However, petroleum is limited. So he said, now that I have the project and the machinery and it is depleted, what shall we do? So after the great acceleration, it is all very simple. I will put it in a container and dispatch it to to Africa, which is basically what we do in those uh, uh, technology landfills. So he talks about bioeconomics and he is also based on the second law of thermodynamics, physics. We all know that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, it is only transformed. And the second law of thermodynamics says that in order to, uh, to achieve work, I need a hot source, a cold source, and uh, from hot to cold in that exchange of heat, I will find work. But it cannot be the other way around because otherwise the ships would sink. Um, and this would never happen. So if I take this bottle and I drop it on the floor, in it inevitably, it will follow the law of gravity. So if I want to pick up the pieces of the bottle again, I have to apply extra energy. If I burn a piece of coal, the ashes will never return back to their prior status. So it's a complete <laughs> process. So the useful energy diminishes. The energy capable of generating work diminishes and entropy will always grow and the universal entropy grows continuously and this is the reality of physics. So if you do not understand this law, well actually some Nobel Prize awardees in physics do not believe in entropy. They know they are lying though, but you know, they maybe they have been paid to deny entropy. So here is an example. Everything uh, leads towards chaos. And if you want to put things back in order, you need to apply energy. A piece of coal has a particular molecular organization. If you change it in order to make energy, you cannot revert the process, basically. And this concept is reality. It's a law of thermodynamics. So when people ask me, uh, maybe from sociology, etc., they ask me, do you want to learn about ecology? Read Georgescu, Wengen, understand the limits of growth and the second law of thermodynamics, and then you will get it all. So we're all fighting with each other. And then we've got the, the COP21 in Paris, etc. And we have read that we have implemented uh, corrective measures. However, emissions continue to grow. Everybody talks about climate change, but it's getting worse. Everybody talks about the SDGs, but uh, we seem to, to be going backwards instead of forwards. And actually, it's quite funny when I see those, the logo, the little icons of the 17 SDGs, you know, if you analyze the icons one by one, we are going worse one after the other. I mean, there is not a single icon where we have improved at every level, but we still continue talking about the SDGs. And well, that's a big problem that we will have to face. Maybe not us, but probably not myself, I'm rather elderly, but probably a great part of the youth will have to tackle that. And 
you know, uh, Dubai is going to organize a COP28 in the United Arab Emirates, and their environmental agency says that they intend to increase uh, oil production 25% and double the gas production. And we, they still continue to talk about the SDGs and to organize a COP summit. Uh, some time ago, I drew this chart, and many people, many environmentalists say that we are uh, uh, rushing to collapse. We have a finite planet with limited resources, and the only resource which is not limited, I mean, the planet is three billion years old, but it is finite, so the only energy which is uh, infinite is the sun radiation. So the scenarios are different. Uh, we have problems with uh, overpopulation. We have inequality. We have the north uh, versus the south. The the biggest consumption in the north is like 100 times the consumption of the south. So anyhow. If I want to talk about equality, it is very obvious that we have to change our mindset. So uh, what people believe in is ongoing growth. The, the economy, as it is taught in the business schools in the world, is a type of economy which is like theocracy. It's the perpetual growth. If there is no growth, we will die. This is what they are preaching. And growth is measured by parameters like the GDP. But if you actually analyze the GDP, you know that uh, prostitution is part of the GDP increase. Also, drug trafficking will increase the GDP. Any natural disaster will make the GDP increase. That is economy. That is the, the economy of the stupid. But they keep on preaching that model, the neoliberal model, which changed after the Great Acceleration, after the Chicago boys arrived, they killed Allende, replacing with Pinochet, etc., with Milton Friedman and his boys. They established capitalism, which was boosted by Mrs. Thatcher. She said, there's no society, there's no such thing as society, there are only individuals, so we should get rid of social welfare, according to her. But they are still uh, running the show, so we need to keep on growing, according to them. So it is getting very hard. What about the public space? You can see in big cities how public spaces are being privatized. <clears throat> the lack of ownership of natural goods, what will we be trading in? Water, let's start trading in water. So uh, you, then you can do some greenwashing and pretend there is something like a Green New Deal and uh, organize something called eco taxes and uh, pollution rights, vehicles which are supposedly non-polluting, or you just go like Vox in Spain and you are simply deniers. You say that CO2 is great and we should continue boosting its emissions. However, on the other side, other people say uh, we love capitalism, but we will try and be more democratic. And actually, there was an economist, Herman Daly, who spoke about the interim state, which means that economy cannot uh, follow the traditional growth parameters and that we should also implement an equal system between the north and the south. But behind all that, what he means is that I will not have my lifestyle diminished in the north. I will just improve 
the, the, the living standards of the South. I will try and strike a balance there, but he forgets to say that that is very difficult because if there are 10 liters of oil that you can spend, I would have to uh, divide in, in two. So many people from the northern countries will have to start saving because if you are preaching that you want equality, such a thing as an interim state would not be attainable in a reasonable period of time. However, they are not mean. They say that renewable energy sources will find a solution. Well, in Spain, for instance, like Minister Rivera says, if we could cover 100% of energy consumption with renewable energy sources, that would be only 20%. But consumption went from 23% to 18%. Why are people spending less power? Well, basically because many people are so poor that they cannot afford to turn on the heating in their homes. And then let's. Let's have had a huge impact as a sufficient ways of lighting. So there is actually no increase in energy consumption. If if we could cover up to 80% with LEDs, that would be okay, but then we have the electric cars. If we wanted to replace 100% of electric vehicles, I mean, I could talk about electric vehicles and many other examples. If you read uh, Dr. Valero's book, you will see that out of the 50 materials that uh, a modern car contains, more than one half has reached its peak. For instance, the lithium battery. There's, there is not so much lithium left. So why don't you buy an electric car? Well. Where are you going to take the lithium from? Do you know how much it costs to charge an electric car? In every electric charger, you would need to uh, take the whole international copper production just to uh, supply the whole of Spain, only in Spain, with electric car charging points. So he repeats this all over again. It is feasible. It is unfeasible completely. But just imagine you get a Renault, which is an electric vehicle, not a very expensive one. So where are you going to plug it? If you go to the petrol station, you have slow charging or fast charging. If you have slow charging, the battery lasts one half, just for a few hours. Imagine we have a garage with 50 parking spots. Imagine the power needed in that house block of flats to get 50 electric vehicles charged. Electri electric cars are for people who live in a, in a single home with uh, a single individual electric charging point. Because otherwise, if you live in an apartment, you would not be able to keep your fridge on during the night if you want to charge your car, for instance. So electric cars will only be for the wealthy, full stop. But they are trying to sell electric cars to everybody, saying that it is a future. It is unfeasible, literally, to replace the whole pool of cars in Spain with electric cars and anybody who just is able to add two plus two can understand that. So I recommend you to read this book by the professor Turiel. And then they say, what about hydrogen? Hydrogen is not an energy source. You know, hydrogen is an energy vector, not an energy source. And hydrogen requires electrolysis. In order to achieve electrolysis, Water has to be heated up to 80 degrees and get an electric string running through it. Then you will obtain hydrogen. But hydrogen is not an energy source. It is a vector. Therefore, it can, it can be stored, but it cannot go through a gas pipe. So in the end, the energy return rate is extremely small from hydrogen, I mean. 
So we are just making business. Uh, so that the economic system continues knowing scientifically knowing that it makes absolutely no sense. So technology will provide, as they say, just five minutes left. Okay, ten minutes, please. I have a little bit left. So uh, having thought about it, I thought that technique is to ideas what technology is to ideology. The invention of the pulley and the wheel were great ideas, but technology <coughs> is in favor of whom? Technology as we know it. What about medicine? There is a, a, a doctor, a Spanish doctor, trying to invent the malaria vaccine uh, where, where thousands of people are killed by malaria every year and nobody cares about the vaccine. However, Viagra was produced in just like two months. So a pulley is, te is technique, however, an electric car is technology. So um, all of that is degrowth. Degrowth is a key word. What does it mean to believe in degrowth? It means that you need to question the whole system. And this would require the whole list of things you can read on the screen. Uh, will it be possible? Well, I don't know. I actually don't know. My friend who spoke in the morning, I'd rather be optimistic, but Gramstein said, I'm, I'm an intellectual pessimist and a volum, volunteer um, optimistic. So I, I can see that everything is pessimistic, but I want to be optimistic about what we can do about it. Uh, look at this graph. <coughs> Six years ago, I have been talking about it for the last eight years, but in the end, I replace sustainable development with economic prosperity because I I mean to say that economic prosperity does not require consumption. You can live very well with 10% of what we are spending currently. So well, now this is fun. Um, tourism. We have a green book which says um, tourism is part of heritage and the other ministry is trying to increase tourism from 90 million to 120 million. They are flying into Spain, they are not walking or cycling into Spain. So this is the picture of heritage and mass tourism. And what else? Well, uh, English tanks. Uh, going through the ruins, the jihadists destroying Palmyra, and a church in Ukraine recently destroyed by bombs. Um, after the Kyoto summit, when I heard about the definition of a museum, I thought it was beautiful, but unfortunately it was not approved. I thought, why wasn't it approved? Well because in the world of museums, there are many contrived interests, just like in any other field. So I read the first part of the definition. The one in italics which talks about the purpose of a museum is to contribute to human dignity and social justice. And then it also says, oh, diversity and sustainability. We, we actually, if we look at Harlem Rundland's sustainability definition has to do with museums. It says 
Sustainability consists of meeting the needs of the current generation without sacrificing the capacity of future generations to be able to meet their own needs. So this was said in 1987 at the General Assembly. And well, they were rather environmentalists. You know, the, the Greens in, Germ in Germany say that um, nuclear energy is green energy. That is a way of the world. There has been an, an exponential growth of museums. And well, this would be Well, so let's talk about a green museum. Uh, we need uh, less energy input. We need to review the social function of a museum. We need to generate less waste and then have a more sustainable museum. What about the LEDs? LEDs are a great invention. Scientifically, they exist since the 19th century, but uh, its technology was perfected recently. So it's a very ecologic technology. However, once again, we have we encountered the system. This man from the 19th century, um, well, was witnessing the the train, the the beginning of the train. So he thought trains are, are so efficient because they use very little coal, and we can make it move. But he said, no. The more efficient something is, the more it will be used. Therefore, the more we will abuse it. This is Jevons paradox. This is uh, light pollution before the LEDs and after the LEDs. So we can see that, unfortunately, light pollution has grown after the LEDs. 1992, 2010. You can see the difference? In the case of the LEDs, well, you can also read it in my book. The use of LEDs in museums is very simple, basically. We have a system that um, casts very little ultraviolet light. Uh, the temperature should be around 3000 Kelvin. From the point of view of energy consumption, we should do a, an audit, a lighting project, and we should try and transform the previous systems into the modern LED technology and to uh, strike a balance between the power and the size of the museum and to have some sort of smart monitoring system. So as soon as people walk into the room, the room automatically lights up. And then, of course, uh, it should not flicker. The light should not flicker, but you should be able to control the flow. However, the light temperature should not change. There, there should be a great versatility of optics, a good design that will improve the appearance and an expert execution. So this is the right way to apply the LED technology in museums. However, what people are using is low quality LEDs. Um, they put LED lights inside showcases without ventilation. So they are keeping the heat inside the showcase without ventilation. There is no regulation and they have very high color temperatures with cold lights and therefore with a higher photochemical power. Besides, they use to replace it 100% without wondering whether it makes sense to replace 100% of the lights with LEDs. Recently, we have uh, intervened in a national museum and, well, the conflict was the, the design had been made by a commercial brand and we would do the assembly and suddenly we realized that 90 uh, systems were spare because obviously if you want the manufacturers to, to, to make the design for you, they will try and sell you 100 units more than you need. So 
you need uh, I mean you need uh, technical advice which is independent from the manufacturer but well apart from that even with a poorly designed lead investment there is still quite a good return on investment and then finally uh, the execution of the project has to be made by experts so this is a part of my talk that talks about lighting. So just to finish, uh, Bruno Latour is a person who believes in degrowth. So he says, we need a new definition of museum. We need to have sustainability protocols, the ontological protocols, like last week, five museum managers, have implemented the deontological code and these people were um, made redundant because of that deontological code. Uh, it's about transparency, equality, democratization, the accumulation of pieces the collection that we were talking about in the morning is uh, very capitalistic. It's just about collecting, collecting, accumulating, accumulating uh, works of art, etc., objects, items, tangible assets. They occupy space, and you cannot store it there for an unlimited period of time. That will come a time when people will die and the works of art will remain forever. So th there is a point in time where there's no longer more room for them. And this is like infinite growth. So we need to think about the social function of art, etc. And the decolonization, which is another very key concept, restructuring, reconceptualization of the museum. What will happen with Prado, with uh, Queen Sophia, etc., <coughs> when in the future we will have to uh, pay taxes? You know that kerosene, I mean, planes that fly with kerosene do not pay taxes for using kerosene. So once people are forced to pay taxes for kerosene, when airfares increase because you know a plane has five times more co2 emissions in the sky than on the earth when that is no longer possible for everyone to fly what is going to happen with those museums that live on tourists so museums need to reassess themselves and promote a local zero kilometer exhibition and if you are el prado well you need to show the locals your works, like Lorca said with La Barraca. Maybe that's more interesting. I, I remember that a professor said that she would uh, invite uh, primary school children to go to the museum, or even she would lend the school teacher some paintings so that they could take them to school, to the school classroom, and show the students those works of art. There, it doesn't make sense to, to store something if it is hidden from view. Um, well, finally, we could talk about many of these uh, concepts like redistribution, reduction, reusing, recycling. There was a, a very good attempt to improve reality, but actually, I think we should change cultural policies. Um, if it was up to me, I would say, first of all, I will make museums a sustainable ecosystem from the energetic standpoint. Uh, secondly, I would organize zero kilometer exhibitions, sobriety, and then uh, fostering artistic creation related to the 
eco-social crisis and then mixing with the environment and giving another function to the museum, uh, making museums different from cathedrals. And just finally, I would like to finish with this quote. Yesterday I was reading about uh, Castorialis, a Greek-French philosopher who really understood very well the whole concept of the 20th century. And well, this is a quote by the philosopher. Thank you very much. Okay, so good afternoon to all of you. We are going to move on now to the last talk of today, uh, which is about educating conscience in the daily uh, uh, transport of um, work of arts. Uh, um, Antonio De Francesco is going to be giving this presentation. He's a uh, has a PhD in um, uh, a PhD in art. He's worked in visual arts, and his first steps related to uh, um, museography were given with the Benancio Croce Foundation. Unfortunately, he was the um, boy for everything in there, so he was in charge of many things, uh, or he did a lot of uh, different tasks, and so this helped him become a seasoned professional. Uh, in 2004, he had uh, uh, he received a grant to go to Spain, to come to Spain and to study at the Miguel Hernandez School, and then he went to Barcelona when he started working in TTI in 2006. An company that a company that specialised in the transport of artworks. Uh, so he's done work in the international and the national uh, levels. He has uh, also taught at the University of uh, Barcelona. So thank you for being here today, and you have the floor. Okay. Good afternoon. I confess that I'm a bit nervous because after. Uh, what we have heard from Miguel Angel and how realistic his uh, uh, presentation was, I felt like the bad uh, one uh, in the movie. I work in a company that deals with the transport of artworks, with art, all of its implications. So. Yesterday morning, I asked some of my colleagues, professional colleagues, to send me a document on our day-to-day -day, uh, work, our day-to-day -day activity, some sort of a documentary on um, professional reality, just to give you a context, a, some background. When we start working with an institution, with a gallery, with a specific client, the first thing that we do when we get there is to prepare the materials and we we use um, tissue on Tyvek, this type of materials, to uh, set up a bag for wastes. The first layer is normally um, stained and what is dirty, so what we do is we uh, use these to make a waste bag. And this is in the morning, a uh, uh, one hour job at the uh, Cultural Centre Museum. So we can see that uh, there is a little bit of everything, cardboard fragments, pieces of uh, sticky tape, uh, plaster zotifoom, bullcraft, Tyvek, uh, some blades, so a plethora of different materials. So at the end of that day, when we take away the waste, we take them to our premises and we organize them in different, we put them into different containers. So over a day of work, we can produce up to four, five waste packs like this. One team only, one mission only. So we normally work in eight or nine different places. So if we do the math, we can conclude that over a day of work, we have a certain amount of wastes in terms of packaging. Everything 
in this assembly, uh, this is even uh, bigger in terms of waste. So, so when I was invited to come to this uh, Congress, I accepted the invitation straight away because I was very excited about coming back to Pontevedra because I love this city. And at the same time, well, I was very excited about uh, taking part in such an important event, but immediately I started having doubts, uh, moral doubts, especially that is strongly related to what uh, Miguel Angel has said, because at the end of the day, I work for a transport company and I am very aware of the environmental impact that the management, I mean, that the operations of such a company involves. But then I started doing some research to prepare this uh, presentation and I started to, uh, well, gather information. And the truth is that I sort of became aware of uh, uh, something that uh, uh, is connected to the daily work and that uh, you sort of forget about, uh, 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 I mean, that uh, awareness of the consequences of your work. It uh, uh, gets into some sort of uh, an, a stagnation state. So I started asking my professional colleagues to share uh, information from a number of departments, marketing, accounts, logistics. And immediately I realized that there was a lot of information, but it was very fragmented. And what I realized was also that my closest colleagues, which are the technicians, cannot access this information that is generated in other departments. And maybe when you do not, when you don't know the consequences of your actions, you don't uh, become aware of them. So I thought it was interesting to uh, start this uh, trajectory of training with a view to sharing it with my colleagues later. So I'm going to give you some information about my company. So these are figures corresponding to materials that we have used up to 16th November this year. So from January to November, as you can see. So we have used up to uh, 7,200 square meters of cardboard, more than 4,000 kilos. Uh, tissue and Tyvek, uh, 21,050 square meters, uh, bubble, plastic, uh, sticky tape, plastazote foam, that's polyethylene. So the figures you can see in the image, so this uh, information has been um, gathered thanks to the accounts department and with the help of the person in charge of logistics. Uh, uh, at the warehouse. So again, what we get is a result of more than 10,000 kilos um, in waste that we have used. Uh, a part of them is plastic and the rest is uh, paper. We have to also include to this, we need to add other materials that have not been able to quantify such as uh, um, conservation and barrier paper, uh, polyethylene foam with adhesive, special tapes, uh, PUR foam, uh, isolating material, wood, metal. I didn't have uh, data for these or figures for this, but this could be added to the total. And we then see that, uh, well, the amount of waste that we actually produce is uh, quite relevant, quite sizable. These are the data for 11 years, a period of 11 months. Uh, we are the third uh, biggest uh, company in Spain in terms of the structure. And in Spain, there are more than 15 thousand companies uh, that deal with uh, transport operations, not all of them involved in art. So just imagine the amount of uh, waste that are generated in 11 years in Spain, uh, only uh, if we consider 
transport activity. So we started analyzing each material to become aware of things, and I concluded that to produce one ton of um, uh, cardboard, virgin cardboard, we would need 14 trees, 150,000 liters of water, and 70,000 kilobat per hour electricity. So we discovered that 90% uh, of cardboard has made is been made out of recycled fiber. So these figures go down uh, considerably. Also, I realized that the cardboard that my company was using does not have a high rate of uh, 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 dissolving uh, elements. It has water-based um, uh, inks. So the amount of Tyvek that we use after 11 uh, months could be used to uh, pack the whole uh, Pasaran Stadium in here in Pontevedra, the football stadium of Pontevedra, three times. So my company, the company I work for, has 27 uh, vehicles, uh, articulated trucks, uh, uh, and other types of vehicles of different sizes, and also personal transportation vehicles. So after 11 months, we have covered more than 1 million kilometers. And we have used more than 200,000 liters of fuel. We need to add additives also. So if we consider the total consumption of the 15,000 Spanish companies that deal with this type of uh, professional activity, and we can imagine the amount of uh, uh, energy consumption that is uh, happening. If we add the fact that uh, also uh, marine shipping is involved in the transport of artworks and also um, plane transport, I mean, by air, and also international uh, actors, because when we send something to a foreign country, well, there are companies like our company receiving this type of uh, products and doing the final deliveries, and also a number of um, vehicles, which are, as, uh, well, trucks, all types of trucks. So these are the type of vehicles that we normally use. So the total kilometers and fuel that have been, have been covered and used is even greater. So as for crates, well, 2022, we have produced a total amount of 1,073 boxes or crates. I haven't got the total uh, cubic meters, but it's a high figure also. We wouldn't have room in our warehouse for all of this. So 40% of them have been reused, but the rest have been dismantled and a company specialized in the management of waste treated this uh, waste uh, individually. So this you can see here are 12 uh, crates uh, that were used in a traveling exhibition over two years in China when they were sent back to Spain. The organization in charge of the management of this exhibition uh, asked us to destroy these crates because they didn't have a, 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 a warehouse for the conservation of, of these or for the uh, storing of this, and we didn't have that either. So we dismantled them and we sent them to a waste management company. So we can see, so we can see the variety of materials that you find in a crate, isolating materials, um, painted wood, foam, etc. So to gather this data, I started dealing with the issue of uh, sustainability and uh, the protection of the environment. So I reached the conclusion that this apathy that I saw in myself and in my professional colleagues, I mean, 
the fact that we need to conduct uh, uh, our uh, professional tasks uh, rapidly and without uh, margin for uh, making mistakes and with hectic paces of work and with uh, complex financial goals. So this awareness of sustainability sort of uh, fades away. So I realized that over this journey of knowledge, I became aware and I started insisting on sharing this with my colleagues and on telling them off when I saw bad practices being uh, conducted. So I think that an important part, an essential part of sustainability is knowledge and also sharing knowledge or knowledge sharing uh, with a view to uh, raising awareness. So we have talked a lot about uh, sustainability today. I think we all know this graph. So I'm not going to I'm not going to be repeating all the concepts and so on and so forth. But I would like to do uh, a summary of the things that I I I realized in terms of sustainability. I realized that. Uh, we could do many things uh, by sharing and at the environmental level, for example, we could reduce the costs of transport, uh, reduce uh, the distances covered, uh, we could use uh, only what is necessary, uh, have an eco design for products that are more useful and more practical and also try and save energy. Also in social terms, and we haven't talked much about uh, the social side of sustainability, I realized that when we have implemented changes at the level of professional working conditions and working environment, the success of the company has increased and also uh, awareness uh, regarding these uh, issues of sustainability. When people are happy, they work much better and they are much more uh, efficient. So improving working conditions, uh, paying attention to the needs of workers and especially supervising the working conditions of subcontractors and providers. I think that well, this is related to well, social, environmental, and economic uh, uh, sides of sustainability. These are important uh, elements, therefore, in terms of uh, development and sustainability. So, basically, I am going to be talking about uh, different uh, blocks. I have decided to divide this presentation into blocks. Um, and I realized that, uh, for example, uh, if we want to optimize resources, we have to have a good logistics. This means that this uh, logistics have to be uh, made uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and has to be uh, adjusted to the uh, demands of the clients. We need to have a good management of the warehouse and the materials. We need to have a uh, good uh, planning of the routes. So logistic issues is something that we need to share with the clients often uh, so that they uh, are clear about the decisions that have been made by the company so that they can make their contribution also and their suggestions and so that they can, uh, well, become an active part of uh, this uh, responsibility. So it would be positive in this regard to share uh, the programming and, planific and planning among companies and institutions so that uh, companies can actually prepare themselves uh, for the yearly calendar in terms of exhibitions, etc. An essential part of this uh, optimization of resources is organizing resources 
in a way that is adjusted to the project that is being implemented. I am talking about uh, material resources and also human resources. So I think that um, in the development of a project, implementation of a project, it's very important to conduct a proper previous study. If every pro project that is going to be implemented involves a previous study of assessment, of estimation, of technical visits to the organizations, to their providers, what to the suppliers when we can actually quantify the number of packaging, the number of hours worked, the number of kilometers covered uh, through an optimal technical study. We are going to be ensuring uh, sustainable development results that are high and we're going to be cutting costs and also we're going to be reducing the environmental impact. Often in my company, we are producing, uh, for example, boxes without a previous measurement just to reduce costs in terms of sending a technician that's going to do the measurements there or because the information, uh, be, I mean, the exchange of information between the provider and the institution doesn't happen properly. So often we need to repeat uh, the process for a rigid box uh, with all the implications in terms of materials, costs, resources and time. Uh, due to a uh, mistake, uh, I don't know, uh, some centimeters or similar uh, problems. So I think that it is of the essence to conduct a previous study before the packaging stage and before the transport stage. Also, we need to have a shared access to information because everything that is happening after the previous study uh, I mean, generating a packing list, uh, uh, also orders for carpentry, organizing routes. All of this information has to uh, be uh, shared responsibility among the different uh, players taking part in the process. This network of exchange information needs to be efficient. And the more efficient it is, the uh, smaller the margin for error is going to be. And also, we are engaging in an exchange of ideas that has been f that, that, that fosters improvements at the management level. Estimation of resources and means. Everything is connected to the previous study. If we manage to uh, define clearly the human resources and the mechanical uh, means, well, we are obtaining a good result in terms of sustainable development, a smaller environmental impact, and particularly, we are not making mistakes in my company. I insist, I have seen that we make a lot of mistakes and there is a cost in terms of materials, in terms of time, and in terms of kilometers as a consequence of these mistakes. And then preparation. And when I say preparation, I mean that if we prepare projects well before we start implementing them, well, we're going to uh, have a good uh, level of sustainable development and I refer to uh, supervising the material stock in the uh, warehouse so that we don't need to uh, purchase more materials and involve uh, suppliers in the process. We need to look at what can be reduced. We need to look at the mm, crate parking as we call it just to determine whether we can recycle some crates and we can offer them to the clients. We need to analyze the amount of stuff that we need to uh, send to the um, uh, working sites uh, and we need to avoid extra hours, stressful activities and, a, and also costs in terms of accommodation, etc. Reducing the environmental impact 
Uh, so in this block, it is inevitable to talk about limiting uh, costs, uh, reusing, recycling, optimizing. So this is something that we do on a regular basis uh, in my company. We have implemented policies for the uh, for sustainable development. Um, so the managers implemented these policies, but the technicians and the various departments follow these policies, but they don't realize that they are actually doing what they're doing in terms of uh, sustainability. So in terms of environmental impact, what can we do? We can reduce uh, uh, waste, trying to limit material uh, costs in the production of packaging and in the transport stage to reduce the ecological impact of waste through proper waste management, attach value to the uh, waste that has been generated. So we need to reuse the waste that has been discarded. And we need to find solutions with a uh, greater uh, shelf life. So we need to offer clients uh, more lasting uh, packaging and we need to reduce transport costs. So in this regard, reducing transport costs involves offering flexible routes on a monthly basis whereby with our truck uh, fleet we are offering clients uh, transport networks or a transport network that is always the same so that we can better use the uh, fleet so that uh, the costs are smaller for clients, for example. So when it comes to selecting materials for packaging, I have realized that there are two different philosophers To put it like that, uh, depending on the origin of the materials, one zero waste uh, material has not been invented yet. When you produce uh, packaging, there is no um, zero waste packaging yet. And when we choose the material, there are some materials that have a greater environmental impact in its manufacturing process, but that can be totally recycled or they can be biodegradable. And I have discovered that biodegradable doesn't exist thanks to this Congress and materials that have a, a smaller environmental footprint but that take thousands of years to uh, decompose, but that give you a greater durability. And then we have new materials that are changing this paradigm. So, if we if we take into consideration the diagram that we saw before, how what can we reduce? Uh, costs in material packaging. So we can offer, for example, this type of PUR foam packaging by reducing the volume of the crate uh, by using other structures, or we can walk in the opposite direction and uh, select a type of packaging that has been made out of paper that is easily recyclable, but which has a greater environmental impact in terms of production. These two uh, systems are efficient and we can choose any of them depending on the shape of the uh, asset and the uh, prevention needs that they have. Waste management. My company trusts a company that operates in the field of waste management. We have an agreement with them and we monitor the way they are managing our waste. So they give us a container and we uh, what we do is to separate waste as much as possible 
And for the last two years, for the last couple of years, we have uh, started, uh, well, paying more attention to these, and we have invested on these, and uh, we have invested uh, in these in terms of human resources and time. But this uh, waste management can be conducted before we go back to, we send this uh, waste back to the warehouse. And we have become accustomed to dividing waste by origin. So in this case, we have a uh, packaging for some um, artwork. So we have separated the different materials, cardboard, bulk craft, tape. Uh, so it is important, uh, this is something that the waste management company has told us, that it's very important to uh, separate cardboard and uh, sticky tape, because otherwise this means that they're going to have to devote a lot of time to that, and they have, this is going to have great cost implications. So uh, for us, uh, it, is, it doesn't take long to separate uh, sticky tape and cardboard, and this is going to be helpful for the uh, management of the waste. So reusing and recycling um, shredders, we're going to uh, uh, implement uh, machines uh, soon that are going to give us the opportunity to, uh, with foam and cardboard, uh, to generate uh, further uh, project, uh, products for uh, the um, packaging. As we saw in Kim's presentation, these machines do not guarantee that you are going to be able to to, um, uh, well, they do ensure that we can use some uh, flexible mesh that together with barrier materials are useful to package uh, works of art for short haul uh, shipping and with uh, temperature and humidity that is kept under control. So this is sufficient as long as we uh, follow the standards in terms of preemptive conservation plans, so that a material that uh, uh, has uh, that causes emissions uh, does not damage the work, we have to try and keep um, temperature and humidity at stable levels. And we're also going to buy a shredder soon to dismantle uh, the foam with a view to producing um, filling materials uh, together with uh, PUR uh, uh, layers. We can use materials that are useful for uh, transporting uh, ceramics, uh, glass objects, etc. As for crates, we have changed our philosophy in terms of producing crates, and we have realized that the design that we used to use with uh, isolating elements uh, and other elements that were too rigid for them to be dismantled. This took a long time. The waste management company uh, uh, let us know that it was very complicated to dismantle a crate. So often they would uh, put it in a shredder and then they would separate waste once uh, they had been fragmented. So with uh, small design changes. We are starting to produce crates where the isolating elements are not being attached to the uh, um, actual crate with adhesive tape, and they are still very efficient for the transport of artworks. They are safe, but they are easier to actually dismantle, to disassemble. So if you look at the side of the crate, we can see a number of pictograms where we have introduced, uh, we have recently introduced, one year ago, we have introduced some sort of a registration number, and we have implemented a crate management program that enables us to have uh, some uh, controlled information on internal and external dimensions of the crate and also the features of the crate. So when we need to recycle 
I mean, previously we didn't have this information, but now we just uh, uh, have a look at a database and we get the information that we need. We find the crate and we adapt it to the specific purpose. So, again, recycling. For example, in this case, when we had to dismantle crates, we came into contact with a supplier that is based in a nearby area that asked us for wood because they were producing these uh, pieces of furniture made out of uh, a small pieces of wood. So we contacted this company and when we dismantled crates, we uh, uh, gave these uh, materials away to these uh, uh, companies so that they can, well, manufacture their product. Rigid packaging. We have already seen that there are two philosophies uh, in terms of packaging. So these different types of packaging have a longer shelf life. So the amount of materials is reduced considerably from my point of view. This is the philosophy that we need to actually apply because the longer the shelf life of a type of packaging is, the less uh, the number of waste that you produce is going to be. So in terms of transport, it is much easier to package, uh, to pack a plastic crate in a box than using foam to fix the different elements. So some rigid uh, packages that we offer are these uh, boxes that are easily moved and also the SP plastic boxes that can be reused uh, many times. All of this uh, rigid packaging can be used as uh, uh, storing uh, units uh, when we deal with artworks. So we are advising uh, institutions often for them to uh, start using this type of packaging depending on the uh, uh, management of uh, the assets that they store. So often we see that there are problems in terms of managing assets when uh, vulnerable sculptures, for example, uh, well, are not regular in shape. So when they are going to put this on a shelf, for example, well, you need to use um, absorbent materials or stabilizing materials so that they can stabilize this uh, work and so that this work can actually be protected. So if they limit the space of the uh, uh, space and if it's stored, taken into consideration, into consideration its actual shape, well, this is going to be much more efficient. And it can be also transported by using this uh, packaging. Tyvek or tissue uh, uh, covers. So what we are doing, and this is still at a experimental stage is trying to produce um, uh, covers for each and every work that we are going to pack. The Tyvek and tissue, they are plastic materials. So if we use uh, thermal sealing uh, machines, well, we can actually seal them. So imagine that an institution such as the uh, National the Museum of Catalonia uh, um, lends 80 assets in two months. So if my company uh, operates these 80 uh, shippings and if every time we go there we use a Tyvek or tissue cover for each uh, painting, well, uh, that paint is going to have its own cover, so the next company, or if we 
uh, deal with that object again, we won't have to use uh, materials again. I mean, that can be used to store that painting with a registry number uh, that is associated with that uh, painting. So we think that this is an interesting solution for the reduction of waste. So, if you are to envelop one of these paintings by using one of these type of tissue uh, covers, in terms of time, I mean, there is no great difference. We can take uh, uh, five minutes longer, uh, depending on the device that we use. But we think that this is interesting to actually offer this type of service. Some other solutions that we have to reduce um, material costs. We used to uh, envelop pieces in barrier material, and then we would fix it within the crate with uh, sh well uh, cushioned materials or rigid materials. In the case of a sculpture, for example, we would use uh, wooden uh, structures inside the uh, crate, and then some cushioned materials, and then a cover for the sculpture. So uh, uh, for the last two years, we have been trying to uh, for the culture sculpture to travel uncovered so what we actually protect is the contact points only with barrier material so that we don't need to use covers which uh, require uh, a lot of uh, square meters of material so we spend a little bit more time but we obtain not only a reduction in terms of waste but also a uh, surprise in aesthetic terms when we open the crate and also a lot of advantages when it comes to handling the pace because uh, many accidents happen when well we used to use uh, Tyvek or tissue covers to envelop the sculpture so this stopped you from actually morphologically interpret the piece and these covers could uh, become you see stuck in vulnerable or fragile parts of the sculpture and this would uh, lead to negative consequences so this uh, uh, it sounds like a uh, good solution another example for the optimization of materials Also, previously, these uh, coffins uh, were used together with Tyvek or tissue tape, and then what, what we are offering now is a design where you reduce the amount of material that is in contact with the artwork, and we reduce the amount of barrier materials, and only the contact points are in, are in contact. So. Uh, the volume of the crate is limited in a rational way so that we don't have accidents, but the amount of material used uh, inside the crate is actually reduced. Another solution that we are using also and that we are promoting is uh, multiple shirt uh, crates when we advise uh, an institution for an exhibition in terms of um, manufacturing crates we always try to limit the number of crates so to reduce the number of crates you have a number of solutions many solutions you have uh, well different uh, devices and you have different uh, uh, well distributions uh, inside the, the crates that you can apply. Also, we have a number of solutions that are useful to store the um, piece once it's uh, sent back to the warehouse. Uh, the use also of travel frames is becoming generalized because they are easier to move. They are useful for storing uh, uh, artworks in the warehouse and uh, also we are designing devices uh, that are useful to um, store work arts with travel frame <laughs> and we can use shared crates also because the volume of the package is uh, reduced just as the amount of um, cushioned materials or cushioning materials we have a number of examples here of uh, this um, 
the structures being loaded and unloaded and moved around. So all of these are updates that we have implemented in the management of the company with a sustainability purpose by sharing information, by trying to pay attention to new technologies and to take advantage of them. And also under the pressure of uh, environmental policies that are more and more present on the daily work of the company. And also because we are very curious and we like to do research and we like to develop new uh, solutions. So we are doing research on new materials such as uh, biodegradable adhesive tapes or partially biodegradable. Uh, foams that are of uh, vegetal origin to 40%, also uh, non-reticulated polyethylene foams that are 100% recyclable and also biodegradable gloves. In terms of transport, we have introduced uh, since the beginning of the year a new technology that it's similar to the information flags at Guggenheim earlier today. So this is a similar technology. It was actually the same technology. There is some photocatalytic coverings on the panels, both inside and outside uh, the structure of our trucks. So thanks to the ultraviolet rays and or light and through a photocatalytic process, uh, they absorb dioxides and they release nitrates. So theoretically or in practice, as a matter of fact, it's been uh, shown to eliminate 130 grams of dioxide per installed square meter so if in a uh, uh, in a three three thousand five hundred kilogram um, truck is capable of eliminating more than five thousand grams uh, of nox uh, on a yearly basis another research and development solution that we are uh, using is membrane crates. Apart from having very good abs vibration absorption uh, capacities, they also um, are very good in terms of uh, storing uh, artworks in the warehouse. And also, uh, they are very um, practical when it comes to packing due to this ge geometrical form. Here we have uh, a polyethylene membrane and the pieces are sort of trapped between two uh, suspended membranes. So we think that this is a very interesting solution, especially for archaeology. It, uh, well, saves a lot of um, foam, for example, for specific cases. So. Finally, all of this that we have mentioned today is the driving force of uh, sustainable development. And this means that you need to keep uh, learning uh, all the time. So my function in the company is, uh, well, mm, technical supervisor of uh, project development. And I have realized that when you share information with your uh, professional colleague on a daily basis, and when you make them curious, and when you raise, their, raise awareness among them, they're going to uh, become more aware of these uh, things. And if sustainable development means to ensure Uh, a better future for coming generations, well, I think that the key is knowledge. Knowledge is the key. Uh, so the future is in our hands. And uh, well, that's it, basically. Uh, thank you very much.
se me escucha, ¿no? Can you hear me? Thank you very much to the three speakers for your presentations. They were amazing. And I think uh, we can open the floor to the discussion now. So that we can all exchange about these topics. Also about the topics from the morning session. So if you wish to ask a question or make a comment, this is the right time. Uh, do you feel like going home? Are there any comments you would like to make? Good evening. I be I come from the world of telecommunications, so I really liked what you said about the recycling award that you received. So um, I really love museums. I really enjoy coming to museums. But at this point in time, I'm 53 years old, so I have lived a lot. I've had some successes, some problems. I think that um, the world is uh, very detached from uh, appreciating people. So all of the things that we have are, are great. They're all nice and fine. But what about people? Because people have made that heritage. And it seems that now heritage is more important than human beings. That's my perception, at least, from, from uh, contemporary society. So I really hate it. Because I think we should do something about it. I think we are somehow misled because I have heard about the concern about the CO2 emissions, the carbon footprint. We are doing pretty bad, but why don't we uh, really appreciate people more? Every person has their problems, but nobody is talking about that. So what about that heritage? It was achieved by the joint effort of so many people. My grandparents uh, were tending to the crops, taking care of their home, and all of that is abandoned nowadays because uh, the next generations have decided to have a different lifestyle, watching TV and uh, forgetting, ignoring the, the, uh, the house chores and farming and all that. And now we have a very polluted world and the heritage is derelict. So what do we do? So maybe those who are responsible for uh, museum management, so maybe they should try and convey to the, to the policy makers that people are also part of museums in the sense that my grandparents were different from me. And if I look back at their lives and their issues, well, maybe uh, that would that would bring solutions to the contemporary problems that we face. The speaker who who spoke in the morning said something similar that we should go back perhaps to the lifestyle of our grandparents, uh, and well. Mm, otherwise, uh, the, the climate collapse will will be the end of all of us. Uh, I went to college, then I was unemployed for a while, and uh, well, people who are maybe older, like me, uh, they have very few job opportunities nowadays. So why that is like an abandoned heritage? So why don't we allow? Uh, those people to use their knowledge and their uh, sensitivity to, to return to the former lifestyle. 
Um, I think this would improve the living conditions of everybody, including the youth. I cannot uh, uh, envision a very good future for the youth if they only worry about the, the carbon footprint. Thank you. Hello. Uh, we are so lucky because we live in the developed world, so we can dedicate plenty of time to reflect upon those problems. But we know that there are more pressing problems than the conservation of works of art, such as uh, eating, having uh, an abode. So we are so lucky to be on this side of the world because we can dedicate time to talking about these things. But I actually agree with you. There are many layers uh, which are above the carbon footprint, which are more important. But I think um, in any historical time, when people start using the word sustainability, for instance, a few decades ago, that's when the world stopped being sustainable. Before that, there was no need for the term because there was balance, maybe, or at least um, people were respecting general laws without over-exploitation of uh, resources and people. So I think that we are like in this bubble and it's difficult to, to, to punch that bubble. I'm sorry, I cannot hear the speaker without a microphone. Well, uh, some people are optimistic and they tell us what to do. Well, there were worse periods of time than ours and they just pulled through. Maybe in 2016, somebody decided that the period that we uh, used to call Holocene should not be called Holocene, but Anthropocene. And then some people uh, decided that, well, maybe it was not correct. I mean, when people say before the pre-industrial period uh, or before the great acceleration uh, this was called whatever and then we call it anthropocene i think we should call it capitolocene it is a system that we gave ourselves which is based on the need to to replicate capital, the need to increase productivity, to make more technology, so as to make productivity more efficient, production, 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 always by spending energy that has to be cheaper. This is what led us to the present point. So it's not an Anthropocene, because I believe that none of us feels responsible for that situation. It is a system which is called capitalism. Therefore, one part of the environmentalists believe that this new period should be called capitalism. So do we have any alternatives to that, to capitalism, I mean? Well, Gramsci said, pessimism, when it comes to the intellect, optimism when it comes to action. Another philosopher also said that we have to make a social commitment and an individual commitment. So uh, I think what's the point of having an individual commitment to live a good, austere life? To, to not to consume or to consume as little as possible or to recycle every single item. I've got five different garbage cans at home. So what's the point in doing that if I sort all of my trash 
But I don't know what's going to happen to all the trash that I sort. So uh, I think at least I I should not take a very long shower or not take a bath, etc. And well, that's all I can do. It is also true that maybe you can also uh, escape from the city, try and run away from the city and become self uh, sufficient, maybe uh, work your soil, uh, open a little farm, but I think this is not going to work out in the long run. You must have like your own ethical commitment, but at the same time you have a social commitment, uh, which uh, should uh, help you relate to your context and try and change the malignant reality. So I think that Everybody, uh, professionals like us. I have spent uh, a lot of time thinking about that and I refuse to be neutral. Nothing is neutral. Technology is not neutral. Technique could be neutral, but the system is not neutral. So you should say what you think. Sometimes this is not easy at all. So I, I will say A and somebody is going to slap me on the face. But this is the only way to fight apathy, which is, was expressed by Castoriades. Individualized, individualism, um, the, the feeling of being insignificant, it's uh, the radical uh, consumerism, the radical individualism, it's like a turmoil where we cannot escape and we are in the hands of the big capital, the big brother. So it is up to each of us, but we will never find um, a personal solution. It has to be a social commitment to actually face capitalism. And there is a reason why we th I think we should talk about that, but not in a shallow way, and uh, not from the point of view of being liberal and progressive and eco-friendly. How do you say it in Spanish? I'm sorry, I cannot hear the speaker. The hipsters, right. I hate hipsters, God. So, because, you know, because they are kind of progressive, environmentally friendly, but they keep their belongings and they have just forgotten about social communication and solidarity. So we are, I think we are on the losing side, but we will persist because you must be optimistic when it comes to volunteering. And I think it is not a good idea to go back to your grandparents' uh, farm. Um, if you want to get rid of malignant technology, well, you can do it. But you should also use the progress made by science so as to achieve uh, wealth, well-being for all. But we cannot do it if we ignore the preservation of nature because we are animals just like the other animals. So we have to to give up many things which are actually useless. They're just, you know, filling up the great uh, void and solitude that we feel. We, we don't need necessarily to go back to our grandparents. Well, I don't think that technology is a solution for everything. Because, for instance, what about the chip manufacturing? We cannot manufacture chips here in Europe, so we depend on the Chinese, we depend on the, on the Asian market, we depend on third countries, and they will decide about what they want to do with us. So our grandparents' lives were worse, but they had a say on their lives. They decided whether they wanted to work more and have more, if they were content with working less and having less, but their lives belonged to them. They had, some of them had their properties too. So maybe they, they, they worked harder than us, 
But actually, we don't know what we're going to, to be like in the future because we depend so much on other countries. We literally depend on them. What if they stop selling chips to us? What if they uh, decide to stop manufacturing chips? What will we do? We'll have no cars. We'll have no heating. So, well, going back to the to the former lifestyle, why not? They they could still live. They could still take care of their children. They could still eat. And now some people have no food. And they're, you know, the, the soup kitchens, they are crowded with, with queues of homeless people. So it's really hard. Life for some is really hard. So what about um, the heritage in ruins? Maybe the administration is, is worried about that. But uh, when, you know, when there is a property owner who no longer needs uh, a cultural heritage and they have uh, left it uh, there to rot, then the administration is going to impose a fine on that owner. But that is not the idea. The government should not be against the, the heritage owners, because actually, sometimes it is worse for you if you have a, a piece of land with a monument on it, for instance. So I think. Um, we need to allow the government to understand that this is not the way. And I think we should also encourage young people to, to, to choose that kind of lifestyle. I actually wrote a mail to Amancio Ortega, the owner of Inditex, saying my, my, families, my, my family had to go to court in Tui. And some of my uh, relatives have to spend their money on lawyers' fees, and maybe that piece of property will never be able to be used by us. Because the, the government uh, is not going to take care of that property. So I asked Amancio Ortega, the Inditex owner, why don't you make an association of young people dedicated to restoring heritage? or, you know, safeguarding heritage. And Amancio Ortega didn't, didn't answer my email. So he, you know, Sarah is making tons of clothes and they have a huge carbon footprint. And Amancio, Amancio Ortega is a very rich guy, so that's good for him. But are clothes really the most important or is heritage more important than clothes? So maybe we need to rethink what our priorities are. And maybe wealthy individuals should rethink what what they, they need. So maybe I will stop buying clothes uh, from Sarah because I'm not interested in, in those clothes. Thank you for your reflections. Well, these are very deep social topics. It is true that we are not talking about the relationship between the heritage and society. We are talking about sustainability in museums. But well, in, in the world of cultural heritage, of course, the intangible heritage has to do with people heritage will not be heritage if society does not acknowledge it as heritage. But that was not the topic of the discussion. But we know, we understand that the heritage is not staff, the heritage is people. And we try and convey that message. So I'd like to return to the topic of the museum and the corporations, um, a bit more specific subjects. Uh, so what about, for instance, a trust transport company? Who makes the decisions in a transport company? Is it the manager? Is it the, the individual staff? Um, I mean, there are grants for that, so there is uh, support by the institutions to make transport more environmentally friendly? Or is it just greenwashing? 
I don't really like the term greenwashing, but you know what I mean. So some people, some, some corporations are trying to do greenwashing uh, while they maintain the same practices. So who makes the decision? I don't know. That is a question that I came up with. Well, I can talk about my own company. I don't know about the rest, but the company I'm working with, not my company, I said. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in therapy, so now I, I have to speak properly. And so the company I work with uh, is working in, in two directions. Those who are working in the field uh, technically share information upstream and what, when that information, when, when those technical solutions uh, arrive, they go through different filters and once the information reaches the, the top managers of a company, if, uh, if, if they are capable of showing that the solutions are both uh, sustainable and financially sensible, then a change happens. So I think that lately we have improved a lot in the field of sustainable development because now we can exchange between the, the top managers and the staff information in a fluent way. And I think that that's the key to sustainable development in the company. So both the technicians and the managers are capable of exchanging information and then each side will understand the advantages um, posed by whatever solution that is proposed. But there is like a joint awareness. The person from accounting will uh, see that the number of cardboard purchase has decreased and then that will be a surplus and then the normal staff will be able to package uh, things more efficiently, faster, so they will feel better about it. So it's like an exchange of information. So sustainable development is also about that. It's about um, not just making a profit, but also um, uh, improving your moral criteria. Uh, can you talk about, I mean, from the point of view of private companies, can you explain to us whether the institutions really appreciate, I mean, when, when it comes to a public tender, do they really uh, appreciate sustainability? I mean, the institutions, when there is a public tender, is sustainability uh, assessed? Or is it just like 20 years ago? So they just uh, measure, you know, the number of crates used, etc. Are institutions aware of that? Because I think that institutions are actually not very uh, sensitive about uh, the need for sustainability. I don't know if it's a matter of ignorance of the of of the technicians, but well, since you are dealing with that, could you explain if you have uh, seen uh, an improvement in the tenders? Well, um, um, I'm not very up to date with public tenders, but we uh, take part in around 100 tenders per year. So you've got to have the ISOs, uh, 2001, the environmental ISO, all of the labels, because they they can ask you to, to produce them and it improves your score. You also must have a percentage of disabled people. You must have an, an equality plan and et cetera. So, does the administration evaluate it? I think that most 
companies, uh, well, if you look at the Iberdrola website, well, that's amazing. I mean, everybody's lying. It's greenwashing all around. So, um, well, you basically uh, jot down everything that is needed for the public tender. Uh, but I don't really know if there is an actual awareness of sustainability. We have, for instance, promoted equality a great deal. But um, after listening to our friend from TTI, well, well, you know, uh, he has taken so many pictures. But every time I go to the warehouse of a company, I have to be wading through piles of debris. So, yes, it's we're all very progressive, but in the end, there is waste scattered all around. So, well, the public contract law is uh, as it is, and well, some corporations uh, can afford to to have ISO auditors. But it is so expensive to have external audits. So you can do it if you are a big size company, but if you're an SME, you cannot afford to hire an auditor. I was talking to Fernando and said, this is so realistic because you can uh, have more points for expertise, but in design contests, which are all about pure creation, you should not have the number of years of experience, etc., that is discriminatory because maybe a 20 year old person has got more talent than you. And maybe you are uh, an elderly designer who is not so good. So I think that that is not the correct way of giving points. And if I talk about digitalization, that is so realistic. Uh, the e-invoice. Well, the first thing I thought when they began with the e-invoice, I thought, this is great. The e-invoice is, is wonderful because you just make it, you upload it to the treasury office, and then they will dispatch it to the corresponding uh, person. But Maybe in a, in, a, in a city council, there will be around 10 different email addresses to which you have to send the invoice. So it is so complicated that for a micro company, they can go mad about it. And technology allows you, I mean, to have a single recipient, which is a treasury, and they will distribute the invoice to the corresponding departments. So SMEs suffer a lot from all that bureaucracy. So now you need a whole department taking care of accounting and invoicing. So it does not make sense. Digitalization has sometimes made things worse. And it consumes 5% of the whole planet's energy. And it's making bureaucracy worse. A company has never had to deal with so much red tape as we do now with the digitalization. Um, I'm rather skeptical from the point of view of our studio, which is exclusively linked to creativity and design. Um, things uh, seem to be getting worse rather than improving. So I think that the, 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 the range of options was less defined before, so m there were many more applicants, but now it seems that the public tenders are just uh, tailored to the big companies. I mean, companies with 10 designers, 10 document experts, 20 content creators, you just cannot compete with that. So actually, they are creating like a second category market where the big company is going to recruit the small studio and the big company is just going to make use of the small studio to uh, apply for that public tender. So that is even more malignant because you actually have no possibility to expand professionally. 
you will never ever have the, the, the requirements to win the tender. And moreover, it's obvious that the public tenders are just copy and paste of people who do not understand what they are copying. They are asking for staff and then in the next paragraph they ask for exactly the opposite thing. The scoring criteria are not clear. They, there is no follow up. For instance, with lighting, what about lighting? They are requiring specific uh, devices with particular conditions. So if you are offering them um, one tenth of the price of the market price of that device, one thing is implementing a LED lighting system and another thing is buying LEDs from the Chinese store and saying that you have a functioning LED lighting system. So we are uh, forced to work for the private sector like trusts because the public sector is unattainable. Uh, in the morning, Sonia was talking about the Guggenheim uh, company selection process. And it seems that the Guggenheim takes care about sustainable development and they give a higher score. And well, some institutions will do that. So I hope that the number of institutions that take this sustainability into account will increase. My company, actually, um, I can see that in their asking for public tenders that you should certify your environmental policies and sustainable development policies. We have uh, documents prepared for that. And they're also asking often, they're, they're asking for waste management certificates. So things are improving in that regard. It's also true that in many uh, public tenders, they are somehow punishing SMEs, particularly when it comes to design. I have suffered from that and it was very painful. <coughs> and I do hope that this will eventually change. And well, you know that there are many different administrations in Spain, Madrid and Barcelona, the big cities. It is, uh, it is not <coughs> frequent to have some strange uh, conditions when it comes to big museums, but there are many different regions in Spain and they all have specificities. I'm not referring to Galicia. I could, I could mention many other places. The only place where uh, I can assure you that there is a clear competition, I mean, with, 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 clear, with clear rules. I mean, wh where we are working more frequently, I would say that the, the rules of the game are clear. But, well, I could tell you uh, thousands of stories. My company is 30 years old, so I have 30 years of anecdotes to share. But anyway, the European Union uh, has been telling the Spanish government to facilitate uh, for SMEs to compete for uh, big works because uh, I'm referring to big infrastructure works because all of that is targeted at half a dozen uh, multinational corporations and all of the rest of smaller size companies uh, which are sometimes very good will, ne will never be able to compete with the big players. They will always be the subsidiaries of a parent company who is usually managed by a corrupt person. That is so unfortunately. So I understand what Fernando says, particularly in the case of design, this is so serious. And in the case of lighting, as an independent designer, I think I was the first Spanish independent designer who could compete with Philips. 
And it was like the story of my life. But it's also reality. And, uh, well, you can achieve it after 20 or 30 years in the game if you're skillful and lucky. Maybe you will get there eventually, but it's a tough job. For instance, the smart design team that I am acquainted with, um, could compete with any design team, with any of the huge design teams in Spain. However, it is ten, ten times harder for them because multinational corporations uh, get it f for granted, you know. Also, with regard to uh, public tenders, often, even though the technicians will assess a technical part of a project, there is a given point in time during that evaluation process where basically they will focus just on the financial aspects. If you just read the, the you know, the small print, you, if you analyze them, you can see that there are, the, the main focus is basically financial. So, um, and I think that projects are sometimes below the public procurement prices. Sometimes it is unfeasible to do it. And I think that public companies do not understand that private, private companies should have a profit margin. So sometimes when you read through the proposals uh, of public tender, uh, uh, just there is like a 20% off that you need to, to, to discount. And that is why many, many public tenders are uh, deserted because nobody is interested in taking part in that procurement. And often SMEs are working, like you said, for the big corporations, which is like the, you know, the, the big fish always eats the small fish because the small fish has no resources to compete with the big fish. And if you are below 20%, 40% in terms of uh, leaves, uh, sick leaves, well, uh, when you're talking about reckless uh, medical leave and then you need to justify it, and well, if you justify it, then well, okay, then that's uh, the reason why you get uh, mm, turned. Uh, so, if it's not this type of leaf, you can justify uh, through some sort of a paper that you're going to do things right, that the one just believes you and they're happy about it because they're saving a lot of money and then you get the results that you get. So this is, uh, well, the tactic of um, construction companies, well, it's harder to see it in our field. So then we get uh, into discussion. So if a work is going to cost one million, somebody says they're going to do it for half a million and eventually what they do is they require 1.5 million for this. So this type of leads uh, ends up turning into extra hours for workers, uh, accidents at work, uh, a lot of stress, so I think that it is good to establish some limits for tenders so that you can stop having companies with, um, um, well, um, results that are not real. So we need to find a way to actually favor us uh, SMEs but we need to be realistic also in terms of the costs of the implementation of a project so that these uh, uh, can enable us to actually safeguard uh, human resources, I mean workers. If uh, there is a company that has 50% uh, of the effective value of uh, work and then they are exploited 
exploiting workers, then that is not good. And I have experienced this in my company. There was some uh, dark uh, times when we would get the projects uh, through this type of uh, tactics, and the uh, working conditions were not good, and there were um, well um, uh, conflicts. Uh, well, and then we have the patronizing company that accepts everything. And this is against you, uh, I mean, totally. I mean, you get there and you have hired a number of services and then the um, civil servants uh, will say that, well, while you're here, you can just do this and do that. So the companies who accept that, then, well, uh, at the end of the day, uh, um, well, uh, that is not good for the sector as a whole. So at the end of the day, I think that the problem is, uh, I mean, something that, uh, uh, needs to be found uh, deeper. So, we well, might think that private companies need to be at our disposal at all times. Uh, it's a bit like uh, some sort of trying to trick you a little bit. Uh, so, at the end of the day, it is us the ones who are demanding that additional effort from the company. And we think that with that. Uh, uh, means that they are sort of taking advantage of us and at the end of the day um, companies are our main allies and we demand from them to invest their time and their resources in finding materials that are biodegradable, more ecologic, that transport is efficient so we want it on that specific day at that specific time. Well. I don't know. I think that uh, the problem is uh, uh, much deeper and is, uh, I think, related to the way things are done from the authorities. So I think that's this copy and taste, copy and paste tactics, something that is happening all the time. And then we asked for quotes from different companies. This is not paid for. This is time that uh, it's been invested by companies. Uh, and uh, well, well, I would like to insist a little bit on the issue that's been dealt with as uh, a person who is in charge of, uh, uh, well, writing this type of documents often. So the documents for technical tenders are Uh, specific models that are controlled by uh, legal uh, audit uh, bodies, but often, well, according to the law, establishes conditions that are very difficult to fulfill by companies. Companies cannot have access to some of the services that are demanded by museums, and I have ex recently experienced one of these uh, problems with a restoration contract for uh, conservation restoration of uh, 11 paintings. Uh, this was a 50-month contract with a uh, high uh, tender price, and this is uh, I mean, by law, we needed to demand uh, a solvency that was greater than 150,000, 120,000 euros, you know, uh, for the company. Uh, so few companies have been able to actually uh, compete in this tender. So at the end of the day, we actually this had a, a winner. And the story ended well, to put it like that. But uh, for companies, I mean, you are receiving this type of uh, commissioned uh, uh, works. And what this is generating is uh, a chain uh, between uh, the administration, the companies, and then the people who are going to implement this project. So we in Andalusia, what we do, what we try to do, apart from including measures, uh, environmental measures, within uh, the framework of, uh, well, tender processes. We also include equality measures to actually um, uh, encourage the participation of uh, people with different genders. And we also place an emphasis on equality plans when companies have a certain number of workers. And this is something that we measure within the framework of social sustainability. So we focus even more on 
well, we've been we've been focusing today on uh, environmental sustainability, but we should include also, or we could talk also about social and, and financial sustainability. So it is complex. There are many uh, uh, cases of low uh, beats. We had one of these. We uh, made a negative uh, report, technical report. This uh, company was uh, excluded. They uh, um, appealed to a court and the court decided that they were right. So we had to give the contract to them because they had presented a number of benefits based on uh, the hiring of uh, people at the risk of being excluded socially. So they tried to uh, try and uh, find uh, some uh, well things that can they can do. But as long as they present some accounts that show that they're going that workers are going to be paid according to the collective agreement well then uh, that is a different story but we have uh, uh, we've been touching a very complex issue due to the different cases due to different realities that are involved in the different authorities that are involved in this process also um any other question Okay, if there are no further questions, we're going to uh, stop here. There is some opening ceremony upstairs. This is for uh, an exhibition that has been organized by fine arts uh, professors uh, for, the la for the last two years here at this museum. So upstairs in the uh, floor of temporary uh, exhibitions, uh, and this is where this uh, open ceremony is going to happen. No food, no free food. Uh, so if you're going to go have a look, uh, you are more than invited. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow at 9.30. Bye now.